Hello, hopefully if you're watching this, you're in my class, uh, CS1030, uh, and uh, you're interested in our unit on networking. If you're not in that class, then, uh, well, hopefully you learn something anyway. Uh, if you are in the class, we've talked about how uh, computers work, how they're connected together, and how there's all these different pieces that are sending uh, binary bits of information across bus lines, uh, connecting a processor to inputs and outputs, um, to uh, memory drives and all of that, to RAM, to ROM. Uh, now we're going to talk about how you can build a network to do the same thing, to connect a computer to a computer, and, and to send binary bits of information across so that the one computer uh, knows what to do and, um, and knows how to handle those intelligently. The story I always tell, if you're in class, I've probably already told this story. Uh, the story I always tell about networking is when I was a young college student, my parents had a cabin up in the mountains and I decided it'd be fun to spend spring break up in the mountains with my friends. So I invited a bunch of people and I said, hey, we can play video games all week and just bring your laptop. We'll connect them together, get them networked together. This was in the days when Wi-Fi was a brand new thing. Not everybody had it. We didn't have it in the mountains, but I thought we could just connect cables uh, between our computers and they'd be able to communicate intelligently to each other. And I have a friend who's actually now in a computer science field and uh, was very smart when it came to computers. And he showed up and said, wait, you didn't bring a router? You need a router. We'll talk about what a router is later in this lecture. But he said, you know, I mean, you can't just hook a bunch of computers together and expect them to talk to each other. Um, in fact, it doesn't work like that, Kevin. Uh, it's a vastly different process. So, uh, so that was kind of funny. And he still tried to write a computer program on each one that would do it. He's a very smart guy. We never figured that out, but we had fun trying to figure it out. And so it turns out the first thing you need to know is you can't just hook a bunch of computers together and have them communicate intelligently to each other. Uh, remember, going back to binary bits, they must be interpreted. Uh, they must be interpreted. Every computer can do integer math. They can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and subtraction. But once you get to sharing pictures, sharing text, sharing sound waves, um, it gets really complicated because different computers have different ways of encoding and interpreting those things. And so uh, when you build a network, you have to think through all those questions. Uh, uh, does the computer who's receiving the message know how to interpret it? We'll talk about that later. So uh, these are the questions when you build a network. If you're an IT person, a network engineer, these are the things, these are sort of the questions you have to ask um, when you're building a network. The first is how is information going to get from point A to point B, from one device to another device? That's called the transmission media. What is the medium by which the binary bits are going to flow from one machine to another? There's two major types of transition media, and you already know this. Uh, maybe you don't know the terminology, but everybody knows there's two types of transmission media. Um, there's um, guided and unguided which uh, we'll get to later. Uh, but first, uh, we also have to um, rate them. We have to ask, how can we rate our transmission media? How can we rate them in a way um, that I know um, how information is getting from point A to point B? The first um, way of rating uh, transmission media is called bandwidth. And that's simply how fast the information can get there. I would guess in the minds of most people, bandwidth is the most important um, transition media. Um, when I go to buy internet, bandwidth is what I'm buying. Uh, I got new internet last April and, um, and they said 500 megabytes per second. That's a bandwidth measurement, MBPS is how fast the information can get across that line and get to my computer. So that's the first way that we rate it. Another way of rating it is signal to noise. Um, that's uh, any time you are broadcasting over a medium, um, the, those electrical wires have ways of picking up more noise. Even phone lines pick up more noise. And so signal to noise ratio is uh, how much stuff is the wire uh, or the wave picking up that has nothing to do with the actual data being sent. Um, we use the signal to noise ratio to then judge transition media by a bit error rate, uh, which is actually the opposite of signal to noise, but it's the noise that can cause the bits to disappear. And that's how many bits are in error to the total amount of bits coming across. Any phone line, any power line, you're gonna have some electrons escape. Um, as they travel across that transmission media. You just are. You're going to have some of the sound wave get degraded um, as it goes across. And part of that is attenuation. 
Um, attenuation is how much data is lost over the distance that it travels. I don't know how many of you guys know this or have experienced this, but if I have a tiny little cable and I'm charging my phone with it and that cable is six feet long, it doesn't charge as fast as if I have a thicker cable um, and it's shorter. So the thicker the cable and the shorter it is, um, the less attenuation you have. Not that much is um, lost or in error um, over that distance. And so attenuation, um, and this is going to be a question on the quiz, just describes the, um, the, the ability or the fact that um, as any information travels over a distance, it will eventually be an error and you'll lose bits. That's true for radio waves too with Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi only goes about 250 feet before you lose the signal, before the signal gets weaker. And so that's how we rate transmission media, bandwidth, how fast, how, how much extra data and noise is it picking up, how much is it losing, and how much is it attenuating, how much over distance are we losing. So with that said, now we can talk about guided versus unguided. Um, you guys know guided versus unguided um, because you know corded and cordless. Unguided is cordless. Guided means you have to have a cord. So guided transmission media uh, basically means you have a line, an actual cord going from one device to another device. You have plugged it in. I have a friend of mine who spent his summer running um, uh, data lines across the campus. Um, and then that year they invented a new way of doing data lines. So that he spent the next summer running new, new data lines all across the campus. And I was talking to him about the merits of having a guided network versus an unguided yesterday. And he told me that guided is safer. You can't hack into a guided network where if it's unguided, any device can pick up that signal, right? So guided is cords, unguided is cordless. So you guys just remember that. Guided means we are actually physically guiding the signal. Unguided means we're just broadcasting it for anybody and whoever picks it up, great. And so Wi-Fi is unguided. Uh, phone line is guided. So with that said, let's talk about the different ways of uh, guiding a network, of using a guided um, network. Copper cords is the main thing that is used. Um, copper is a conductor of electricity and you just blink ones and zeros across that thing in a rhythm just like a bus line would work. You just go, if it's on, you send power across. If it's off, you turn power off and you just do that on a beat and then the receiving device knows how to do it. But once again, just a copper cord is not going to get the job done because um, because electricity, electrons are everywhere, all in the air around us, um, and copper cord can pick up electrons and lose electrons. And so uh, when you're trying to really get high bandwidth, when you're trying to get a signal across that cord very quickly in very small spurts of information, um, then the data can very easily be corrupted if it's just a plain copper cord. So they invented what's called a coaxial cable. This is what's also used in cable um, channels on TV back in the day, your parents or probably your grandparents at this point all had cable. Uh, that's when a cable company ran a cable from their company to your house. That's literally what they did. And it's basically all a coax cable is, is it's a copper um, wire with a very heavy shield. And the shield prevents the electrons from escaping and it presents the noise from getting in. And so if you have a shield, you don't get the attenuation. You don't get as much. Uh, you still get a little bit and you don't, and you have a low signal to noise um, ratio. So that's one way of doing it. It's just a copper wire, but with a really thick shield that keeps the electrons that you want to keep in and keeps out the electrons you want to keep out, out. So then there's another way of doing it that isn't as thick as a coax cable. Um, and that's twisting the two copper cords together. Um, this is a fascinating concept. If you twist the cords together, it creates a magnetic field and you send the signal across two copper cords. And because you twist them together, if electrons are trying to escape, it actually pulls them back in, uh, which is it uses physics to do that, which is crazy. And so, um, so the electrons think the orbit of a planet. It's the exact same 
um, exact same concept. Uh, uh, our planet orbits the sun because every time it tries to escape, the sun pulls it back in and keeps it going in a circle. When we twist two copper cords together, it pulls the electrons trying to escape back in just as if they were on an orbit and the copper cord, the electrons flow to the um, source. It also creates a magnetic field that keeps um, noise out and so it, it helps both ways just like a coaxial just uses a physical shield twisting copper cords together creates an invisible magnet shield it's really cool um, and then you have the mother of all guided cords which is a fiber optic cable a fiber optic cable um, is actually a glass cable and it's microscopically small believe me um, and they flash light through it and so fiber optic cable is not electrons and not a sound wave we're going to talk about sound waves here pretty soon um, it's not uh, um, a uh, electrons. They actually are blinking light through. You guys know light doesn't degrade. Electrons degrade. Um, electrons escape over time. They don't degrade. They escape over time. Uh, but photons keep going. They travel in the same distance. At night, you can go outside and the, your human eye can see stars that are billions of light years away. Um, and so light doesn't degrade. And as long as you keep the fiber optic cable enclosed and dark, it doesn't escape. And so it blinks light uh, among a... Uh, through a glass line. The other nice thing about fiber optic cables is um, is they're uh, is they're fast because light actually travels faster than electrons do, and so light travels at the speed of light, and light is the fastest thing that we know that travels. Nothing travels faster than light that we know of, um, and so uh, so fiber optic cables are fast. They're one gig speeds, whereas your coax cables you're getting up to a few megabytes per second. Um, so fiber optic cables are incredible. They're just light traveling along. A glass case and so that's going to be on the quiz too um, so twisted pair we've already talked about but there are two more words you need to know um, inductance is the ability from one electrical cord to steal from another electrical cord and impedance is when you have two opposing currents they slow electricity and so when you twist them together it eliminates both the inductance and the impedance uh, by the way back to fiber optic cables you don't have either in a fiber optic cable because that doesn't happen with light right so one cord can steal electrons off the other so if you twist them together the electrons go in that in that circular motion orbiting motion down the cord to where they get to where they need to go so inductance one cord steals from the other Impedance is when you have opposing currents, they slow electricity, but when you twist them together, it eliminates both, which is a, just a huge thing. So, um, so in the early days of the internet, um, they actually used sound waves. They didn't use those cords I just talked about, um, but uh, they realized before Wi-Fi was invented um, that they would have to run new wire all over the United States to make the internet work. And so somebody stood up and said, wait, didn't a century ago, didn't we just run wire all over the United States? And isn't there already an infrastructure where we have wires going everywhere? In fact, we did it twice. We did it with power lines and we did it with phone lines. Well, power lines power your house, so you can't exactly use a power line uh, to do the internet as well. Um, but we can use a sound line. We can use a phone line. And so they created what's called a modem. A modem um, takes sound waves and converts them to electrical bits that can then be used by a computer. Back in the early days of the internet, um, we could get the internet through our phone line. They did this using three different ways of sending the signal across. Phone waves, you know, aren't binary. Um, there's literally thousands of different heights a sound wave can be, and there's thousands of different lengths it can be. It's, it, it's not uh, an on or off system. And so what they decided to do was they designated one frequency as on and designated a low frequency as off. And so if the phone signal was sending a long beep, then the modem would translate that into an electrical signal and it would deliver it to your computer as a one. If it, if it gave a short beep, something like a beep, um, instead of a beep, instead of just a beep, then, that, then the modem translates that to a zero and sends it to your computer as an electrical not signal. Um, fascinating. And so long and short uh, stood for one and zero. That only got them so far though. That didn't get them all that far 
because you still can't, yeah, sound waves only travel so fast. They're really not, sound waves are pretty slow, actually. Uh, we have planes flying overhead every day that break the speed of sound. And so, uh, so they ran out of information that they could send across one phone line, um, which was kind of a crazy thing. So then they said, well, we need to double our speeds. How are we going to double our speeds? Well, then they use what's called AM, which is amplitude modulation. The first one is frequency modulation. Then they decided to do amplitude modulation. Uh, modulation. Amplitude is mo modifying the volume. And so then it was loud and quiet. And so if the, the sound wave coming to your modem was really loud, loud, then that was a one. And if it was really quiet, that was a zero. And so now you could double your speed. You could both deliver ones and zeros through the frequency and the volume at the same time. That worked for some time. But eventually demand caught up and now um, they had to come up with a third way to deliver ones and zeros across that line. And that is phase modulation, which is late and early. And so if the sound wave was happening on time, then that was a one. But if it came just a hair of a tenth of a hundredth minutes millionth of a second late, then that was a zero. Um, and so, uh, so they had to manipulate sound waves um, to... Um, to deliver ones and zeros. So frequency is um, long, short. Um, amplitude is uh, loud, quiet. Um, think tall, small. Um, and phase modulation is late, early. And, and anybody that has a modem in their house, those are the ways they're getting the internet. Um, and the modem is listening to the sound waves coming across and then interpreting that. You have a hardware piece in your modem that then shoots it to your computer as electrical signals so the computer can translate them. Isn't that wild? Isn't that crazy how they figured that out? They said, we don't want to run a third line all the way across the United States and hook it up to every house. We just did that with phone lines. We just did that with power lines. So they said, let's just use the phone lines. Um, and so now then, um, the problem then, though, with modems, the other problem, there were multiple problems that they had to solve. The next problem with sound waves is that, um, is that one block shares the same incoming line. And so my phone line in my house, I share it with all my neighbors. I have a designated piece coming off into my house, but we're using one line. So then they use time slicing, which we talk about with operating systems. Operating systems divide the processes up into a fraction, each fraction of a second, each application on your hard drive. The operating system gives it a fraction of every second to receive and do what it needs to do using the processor. Well, they did the same thing with phone lines is um, they gave everybody their own frequency. And so they divided the frequency up. And then if a sound effect was coming through your phone line that wasn't your frequency, your modem learned to ignore it because some other house needed it. And so then time is they gave every house its own fraction of a second. And so when I use modem internet, which I don't use anymore, I'm on a fiber optic cable now, which is way better. But when I used phone line internet, a modem internet, um, I only had a, like a, a hundredth of every single second to get the internet I needed, to get what I needed. And then the 99 other hundredths of a second went to the other 99 houses on my block, uh, but then I would get that second back, and, and the idea was to get so much information across that one one hundredth of a second, I didn't notice that I had poor download speeds. It doesn't always work, by the way. Uh, modem internet's really the worst internet to have now. I'm much happier with the fiber optic cable. Um, frequency then was giving everybody their own their own volume level. And so it was dividing the frequency up further. Um, and, and so you could communicate multiple waves across multiple frequencies at once. And so a uh, fascinating way that they used to do the internet. We're moving away from modems now, but modems um, convert uh, the internet by modulating tones. That's what you need to know. Modems modulate sound waves, also known as tones. So that's modems. Um, now also there's something called a digital subscriber line, which is basically you get your own phone line and you don't have to worry about all that modulation on the other side. Uh, you get one distinct line to you that carries only your internet. You don't have to share it with all your neighbors. You don't have to worry about those two things. So that's what a digital subscriber line or DSL is called. If you ever hear DSL, that's what they're selling. They're selling you a phone line that just delivers to your house only your internet. You don't have to share it using phase modulation and tie and amplitude modulation with your neighbors. So, so that's about phone lines. Um, now let's talk about unguided 
um, internet, that's a much easier conversation. It's going to take me very much. Uh, your phone right now is probably hooked up to four unguided networks. Uh, one is it's one of the G's, 4G or 5G. Uh, it's probably connected to Wi-Fi and it's probably connected to the uh, cellular network and probably Bluetooth. Um, oh, and GPS, that's five. So, uh, although the cellular network is the G, so I counted that one twice. So it's, it's four. Um, so basically in an unguided network, a lot easier. You have a transmitter and you have an antenna. And a transmitter takes electric signals, radio waves, and uh, takes electric signals, converts them to a radio wave. And then the antenna on the device um, converts it back to the electrical signal for your phone. And so right now there's a transmitter, either a satellite in space or a tower up on a mountain somewhere, and it's sending radio waves just out over the valley for anybody to use that, that whose device can connect them. And then you have a tiny little antenna in your phone that's listening to those radio waves and converting them back into the electrical signals so that you can watch Netflix or whatever you do on your phone. Play Among Us, that's the big game right now. Um, there is a thing you need to know, A01.11 is a body of regulations that specifies how Wi-Fi works. There's a group that puts out, um, uh, that says if you want to create a Wi-Fi network, here's the transmitter specs you need, here's the antenna you need, and if everybody follows that, Wi-Fi works. If my Wi-Fi doesn't follow 801.11, your phone won't be able to connect to it and vice versa. So, so there is actually a team that sat down and said, here is the types of electrical waves we're going to use. Uh, if anybody wants to be on a Wi-Fi network, here's the transmitter you need. Here's how your antenna should work. Here's the protocols for that. And that's what makes Wi-Fi work. And as long as your phone is designed with the 801.11 specifications, then you can connect to any Wi-Fi network in the world. Um, so if it's not, then you're not. So um, such so as a little thing about unguided. So unguided is much easier. You don't have all those cords. You don't have all that phase modulation with the telephone line. Uh, unguided is just radio waves, and there's just different types of radio waves for different types of networks. Uh, 801.11 specifies the Wi-Fi one. So um, very much easier. So then let's talk about types of networks. That's the next thing to talk about. So that's how networks work. That's how we can connect them together. Um, now there's three types of networks. LAN is the most popular one. Uh, ow, see how we say that in this lecture and I'm always wrong. LAN is the one you're going to be most familiar with. That's a local area network. That's what Leighton Christian Academy has. Um, that's what I have set up at my home. That's what I have set up at my church. It's just you have a router. People can connect to the router through Wi-Fi. Most Wi-Fi is a local area network. The Wi-Fi signal only goes about 250 feet before you lose it. So it creates an area of 250. Um, there's also what's called a widespread area network. So that's your cell phone. That's 5G is a widespread area network. Uh, GPS uh, is a widespread area network. It spans the whole globe. Uh, it's a global area network, really. Uh, Bluetooth uh, is a local. Bluetooth is local area network. Um, wide area network is your cellular signal. It covers a wide area of places. It covers a whole state, a whole uh, county, right? Um, and then you have a WLAN, which is what Wi-Fi is. It's just a wireless local area network. It's, an, it's a network that doesn't run wires. It's completely unguided. It's wireless. So those are types of networks. You need different things to set up different ones, uh, but that's just some terminology for you. Um, Here's some more terminology for you. We can talk about topologies. This is how you're connecting those devices to each other. A ring topology is you're connecting device to device. So you have a ring. That's what I tried to create at the cabin at the story I told 23 minutes ago at the beginning of this video. Uh, you have a ring and you're connecting device to device to device and you just connect a line through them. It's a glorified computer really because you're just connecting bus lines. Um, you still have to do some programming to get them to communicate with each other and set up some things there which we weren't able to do way back when at my parents cabin in the mountains. Uh, but that's a ring topology. Usually it forms a ring. So if, device, if all the devices are connected to each other, it rings around. Uh, you can also do a bus topology, uh, which means you hook all the devices to one line. And so in a ring topology, you have a different line between each device. A bus topology, you connect all the devices to one line. Um, in a ring topology, typically the devices are mirroring each other. Typically they're all, so think about two monitors being hooked up to one computer. That's kind of a ring Topology, it's really a triangle if you map it out. Uh, but a bus topology is the there's a one common line going through all 
um, that all the devices are connected to and they can all send messages to each other through that line, but you don't really have one device that's in charge per se. So you still have to send the messages and, and hit receive the messages um, and you have to set all that up. But right now, by far the most popular one, and this is true, the most popular topology is what's called a star topology. This is where you have one device, usually a router in the middle, and then that router is sending and receiving all the messages between all the devices. That's what um, internet, net, that's what Wi-Fi networks are. I have a router at my home. We have a router at LCA. We have a router at my church. And it's both sending and receiving uh, messages to and from. So Star Topology is the really popular one now. They're really easy to set up. You just have to buy a good router and connect. All the devices connect to the router. You don't have to worry about connecting the devices to each other. Just as long as they're connected to the router, they're connected to each other through a router and so um, other things when you set up a network you're going to need uh, these are lists of things you're going to need one is you're going to need a card a network interface card your wi-fi chip and your phone is a network interface card your gps chip is an example of one uh, your sim card your phone sim card is an example of one this is the card the chip it's really a chip whose job it is to interpret the signals coming in in a way that the rest of the machine or the device can understand and so if bits are coming in, um, it, it, it's the network interface card to know what those bits mean, where they should go, uh, where it should direct those bits, uh, how they should be interpreted, how they should be translated. Um, if you don't have a network interface card, and this was the thing we were missing at my parents' cabin way back when, we didn't have network interface cards. Um, and if you don't have NICs, you're done because it's their job to know what the heck's going on. Um, then there's some other things you might want. Um, I just said Wi-Fi signal degrades after 250 feet. Well, what happens if my facility, my house is larger than 250 feet? Well, then you install what's called repeaters and it's just their job to amplify the signal on a longer wave. So a repeater's job is to listen and then repeat to an, in another direction. And so it's to listen to the right, and repeat to the left, right, uh, or left, right. And so repeater just receives one thing comes in and it sends the same thing out, but in a longer direction, it amplifies it and sends it out. A hub then is a repeater, but it's a repeater uh, that can do both inputs and outputs. And so a hub um, is something you can connect multiple devices into. And so a repeater can just receive one input and communicate one output, and it can only output what it's inputting. Well, a hub um, is a repeater that can actually receive multiple inputs and multiply uh, the signal, amplify the signal to multiple outputs. And so a hub has many coming in and many going out. A repeater has one coming in and one going out. A switch then, is a hub, but with a switch on it. Why do you think they call it a switch? Uh, it's a hub that has a switch on it that it can actually receive an input from something that it's also outputting to. So a hub has one side for inputs and one side for outputs, and it can only output to the outputs and it can only receive from the inputs. It can't switch. A switch can switch. Uh, a switch can both listen to a device and speak to a device. A hub can't do that. It can only listen to one type of device and talk to another type of device. And then you have a bridge, um, which is a special one used only for bus topologies. And a bridge just a, gives the uh, data an address to keep it from going to all the machines. And so um, in, a, in a bus topology, um, if a machine sends a signal out, it goes everywhere. But if you install a bridge there, um, then it can actually only communicate to one um, device. And so that's what a bridge is. Um, so those are some other things, some terminology you might need or want when you set up a network. Um, two more things, a router then is the next in the evolution of a switch. Um, a, so a repeater receives from one, sends to one. A hub receives from multiple and can send to multiple. A switch uh, is a hub that can send and receive to multiple and then a router. Um, can manage multiple networks. It's the next step up. It can receive multiple inputs and multiple outputs from multiple networks. The router, when we talk about the network, which internet, which will be in the next lecture, the router is the heart of the internet. The router is what makes the internet work. It's the heart of the internet. Um, without a router, you do not get the internet. So we'll talk about that, but you do need to know that. That is on the quiz. What is the heart of the internet? 
it's a router. Uh, without a router, the internet, you can't make the internet work. And then for safety reasons, we'll come back to this when we talk about computer safety. Um, we'll talk about a firewall. A firewall is a physical device. It's an actual physical device in your computer that keeps out harmful information. Um, so we'll talk more about how that works uh, when we get to computer safety. So um, one last thing we need to talk about is ISO OSI protocols. Um, I know this video is a lot of information. I'd recommend you watch it two or three times. Um, ISO OSI protocols are, uh, it was a group that got down and said, when you make an internet, these are the seven layers, seven things you have to think about when you're making a layer, uh, when you're making a network. And so, um, and a protocol is simply a rule or a structure that guarantees information has been passed accurately from one party to another. Um, so uh, this week's assignment is a protocol assignment. So think about the other areas of your life where information is passed from one entity to another entity or one party to another party. Um, there's protocols for that. My wife and I don't have good protocols sometimes. Sometimes she'll be leaving the house and as she's leaving the house, she'll say something like, don't forget to take. And I'll be like, what? What did, what did she just say? And then usually I'm dumb and I think, oh, it probably didn't matter. But really what she was saying was don't forget to take meat out of the freezer for dinner. Well, she's going to get home and we're not going to have dinner. And she's going to be mad at me, but I'm also going to be mad at her because she didn't complete her sentence, right? So a protocol is meant to keep that from happening. A protocol, whenever you're sending information from one party to another, from one device and computers to another, um, a protocol is a rule or a structure that makes sure the information has been passed accurately. Um, and so what my wife needs to do in those cases is she needs to sit me down, look me in the eye and say, hey, hon, don't forget to take me out for dinner. And that would be a good idea for her to have another protocol where later in the day she texts me and says, hey, did you take me out for dinner? That is a way of guaranteeing I heard her. She's yelling at me as she's rushing out of the house. I, I might be buried in a book and concentrating on a book. I might be watching a video. I might be playing a video game, right? Um, hun, can you please pause your video game? I have something to tell you. That's a good protocol, right? Um, and so uh, if you think about it, all of your life, ha there's protocols all around you. Um, the United States Postal Service has protocols for guaranteeing that mail has been delivered from one party to another. Um, so classrooms are all protocols, right? Our classroom is a protocol. We have a bunch of protocols, which means you show up to class on time. You do not leave till the bell rings. Um, you take notes. I present fun lectures that are engaging and interesting, right? And so um, it's the same with computers. If I'm going to design a network, I have to design rules and structures that guarantee that information is getting accurately from one device to another device. These are called the ISO OSI protocols. There's seven of them. And there are seven questions you have to ask when you set up a network. If you're setting up a network, these are the seven questions you have to ask. The first one we've already talked about. It's the physical one. Um, physical is just how is the information getting from point A to point B? How is, is it radio waves? Is it a phone line? Is it a cable? Is it a fiber optic cable? Um, just how is the information going to pass? That's one of the easiest questions to ask and answer. How is the information um, getting from point A to point B? So if I'm delivering you, um, if I'm delivering letters to someone through you, if I am asking you to deliver letters for me, the physical layer would be me telling you, here's some letters, right? I want you to deliver these letters. You are the physical layer. In a computer, it's the wires or the radio waves, right? The next one is the data link. The data link layer uh, gives the data an address. It says here is where the information is going. If something, and then if if you can't get it there, here's what to do. And then the next thing is here is how to get it there. So it's the instructions for how to get it there. There has to be instructions that say, here's where they're going. If I gave you letters, you're the physical, um, I would say deliver them to Steve, right? Give them to him one at a time and one each day. And if there are any problems, let me know. So that's the data link is how is the, you know, um, what's carry, the physical is what is carrying the information. The data link is how is it getting there? And, uh, and what, what, um, um, what packets is it going to get there in? How many pieces am I going to divide it up into to get it to where it needs to go? The network layer then uh, is a map. 
it chooses a path across and between the devices. And so that would be like me telling you, don't take the letters by airplane, take them by car, go down Main Street, turn left on First Street, go down two blocks, and there you'll find Steve. Um, so it, it maps the path across and between the devices. And so um, it's not enough to just say, get this web page from Google service to my device. Google actually has to figure out, sit down and figure out a map by which they can get their information to you. And by the way, it's not easy. It's amazing they do it as fast as they do it. It's not easy to make a map to every single device in the country, and yet they have to do that. That's the network. That, so when you hear network, think, how is it going to get across the network? How is it going to get from point A to point B? Then you have the transport which is the actual who's responsible that it actually gets there. Uh, if, I, if your name's Lisa, this is me when I say to you, I'm trusting you, Lisa. If there's any problem at all, you better let me know, right? So this is where we map out the things that might go wrong and make rules for if something goes wrong, what's going to happen. How are we going to try again? How are we going to know that something went wrong? Let's say Lisa goes out and she gets lost and she just throws the letters in a trash can and then she goes on with her life. I, I have no way of knowing that it failed. How am I going to know it failed so I can try again? I'd much rather Lisa comes back to me and says, let's try again. And so the transport layer in networking is writing a computer program that if it doesn't succeed, somehow I'm notified. Um, I accidentally typed one of my uh, church members' emails into my email server wrong, and I get five emails a week from Google telling me we don't know who to give this to, which is really annoying, by the way, but that's the transport protocol at work. It's letting me know there was a problem, letting me know they couldn't make it. So that is what's responsible. Transport layer is, is how are we going to guarantee it gets there? How are we going to know when something gets wrong? And then you have the session layer, which certainly just dials the session up. This is like Lisa knocking on Steve's door, right? Kevin asked me to give you this letter, right? So it sets up a session between two devices, and then it presents the data. It hands it over. Uh, oftentimes, because different machines interpret different binary bits differently, there's encoding that happens and decoding that has to happen. Uh, presentation means you have to format or decode the data to the correct language. So if a web page is coming in as XML, and I need it to be HTML. It helps to have a computer program whose job it is to translate from XML to HTML so I can still see the website. And then if you have an application layer, that's another easy one. We begin with an easy one. We end with an easy one. The application delivers. Um, it's, just, uh, the, uh, it's just applying the data. Steve is reading the letters. He has them. They've been interpreted. Let's say I wrote them in English and Steve reads them in Spanish. They've been interpreted into Spanish for them. For him, he reads them and he knows what to do and it's been applied. And so those are the seven ISO OSI protocols. You do need to know them. Uh, you do need to be able to identify uh, what they are and tell me about them and say this is what they do. And so you're gonna wanna click through these slides or replay through this section over and over and over again. Because uh, this is important. They are the seven things you have to think about when you set up a network. I'm going to go through them again real fast. Physical is the actual physical connection. Data link is addresses it and notifies if there's any errors right there. And it orders and frames how the information, like what packets the information is going to go in. Um, it divides the message up and sends it a bit at a time. The network uh, chooses a path across and between the devices. Network is the map, maps the way the information is going to get to where it needs to go. Transport is responsible for guaranteeing it gets there. And if it doesn't get there, how am I going to know? Um, session sets up the session between the two devices, knocks on the door. One computer Google servers connect with my server, um, with mine. Uh, presentation formats and presents it. And if it needs to be decoded, decodes it. And then it's applied. So, uh, so whenever you're building a network, you have to think through those seven big questions. Next time, we're going to be talking about the internet um, and how it works, how it uses these seven protocols to create the internet where all the devices in the world can be connected to each other. So that's what we're going to talk about um, next time. We'll see you then.